<laughs> so welcome everybody to the student programs and services uh, meeting for Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. So our first agenda is uh, art and music classroom instruction during COVID. And we're incredibly excited to have some teachers here to talk from the music department and the art department, um, along with a lot of our uh, teachers here also to talk about our other agenda items on today's student programs and services meeting. So I know that I am also excited to hear from them directly, uh, working with our students each day um, through the hybrid and remote learning model. So I'm gonna turn it over to Becky to get us started. Uh, Becky's an art teacher at Hamner. Um, elementary school and I'm going to turn it over to her to get us started and tell us a little bit about what is it like to teach art in the in the hybrid model Becky. Thank you Sally. Hi everyone. Good evening. Um, I pre-recorded pre this for myself because I love visuals but also because my regulating husband's out of town and I have children so I'm going to be playing a short video that kind of gives a glimpse as to what we've been up to. <clears throat> quality sketchbooks for each student. These books move with the hybrid students and are a reliable material for remote learners. Students may use any material that they have available to complete assignments. I have students who have entire studios in their home equipped with any and all art media. Conversely, I have students who rely on the twistable crayons that their classroom teacher provided at the beginning of the year. To add interest to their tool bag, I've demonstrated ways students can maximize resources to enhance their artwork. Diluting coffee or adding water to washable markers can offer students a watercolor-like medium, for example. Translating the K-6 art curriculum has been tedious, but an incredible feat that has taken patience and a lot of collaboration among the art teachers. Our strengths have never been so apparent. In my lessons, students ultimately have the choice whether they would like to respond digitally or in their sketchbooks, or both, with the latter being the popular choice. Art is now mobile, and my art cart a glorified Chromebook holder. <laughs> Each lesson is delivered as if all students are remote learners, which provides consistent and effective assignments for each smartest artist. These lessons are presented in slides on different platforms, including Google Classroom, Seesaw in our school unified arts website. Demonstrations are pre recorded to troubleshoot any technical challenges that inevitably arise as I move from classroom to classroom throughout the day. I use the live meets more as a place to introduce lessons, connect with my students, and support their learning, but also deliver instruction. Truth be told, us art teachers miss the mess. We miss giant awkward papers, heaps of scraps, working with clay, distributing a vast assortment of materials that students wait anxiously for. Never have my hands been so soft in January. Typically this time of year, they're cracked and bleeding from all the time spent in the sink cleaning up the art room. The same art room that is currently filled to the ceiling with all the creature comforts of a classroom, bookshelves, flexible seating, like beanbag chairs, blocks, kindergarten kitchens, and more. From where I sit or stand or roll to and from, the positives unquestionably outweigh the negatives teaching elementary art in a pandemic. This has challenged our department to do what we do best, think outside the box. Personally, I'm employing my skills and passion of graphic design like never before by designing interactive lessons on Google Slides where students can immerse themselves in an artist's style and technique. I have been awarded the privilege of meeting grandmothers, therapists, cats, and baby brothers. My students have demonstrated tremendous effort, resilience, growth, and creativity beyond my expectations. We will take so much more from this school year than it could have ever taken from us. Ah, oh, great. So in a nutshell, that's been elementary art and I'm proud to have represented the elementary art teachers on that. Becky, thank you so much. It's what a way to think out of the box, a great a great way to start it. And so very true to the work you guys are doing and collaborating across the grades. Um, so I'm gonna um, also introduce Andrea Haas um, from Wethersfield High School to also talk about secondary art. I was muted again. Um, 
thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I also have some visuals as well. Um, being visual people, that's what we go for. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, not quite as um, it's it's more static because it slides, but um, that was a great slideshow, Becky. Great video. All right. So I just want to ask, can everybody see my yeah. screen? Okay. Looks good. All right. So, um, whoops, that was not intentional. Um, so uh, our instructional practices have definitely changed um, and we've had to kind of think outside the box a lot, um, but um, that's what we do. Um, the, artists are problem solvers. So we set out to solve some problems. Um, so we do a lot of visual journaling using um, slides uh, to collect the images of students at the beginning of the year had a supply list so that they needed to get. Uh, one of them was also a sketchbook uh, to have and that way students could bring them back and forth and the remote learners would have them at home. Um, but they took their artwork that they created in their sketchbook and they um, put it into a slideshow. So that was their way of sharing it, um, which um, worked great with the remote learners or the students who became remote learners after being in one or the other cohort. Um, so one of the things that uh, I tried that I had never done before that we're using is Jamboard for critiquing. Students were able to upload their artwork and then other students were able to make comments. And then it was a great way uh, to actually have a verbal critique. Um, students would share their own screens and uh, this especially worked great with AP um, and my art three class. Uh, thinking more about process. So having process portfolios and through slideshow um, and through written reflections, uh, which I mentioned below, students are able to talk more about their process um, because I can't see them work. And so the, I needed to ask questions to get them to really think about what they were doing. Um, and so we've been using a lot of reflections. One-to-one -one meetings with students doing breakouts while the rest of the class is working has been great because I've been able to get to know some of the students that I wouldn't otherwise get to know when they're in the full class. Um, and then there's been a full, a uh, big focus on student choice. Um, and then trying some video demonstrations of, um, of different techniques. Uh, and I have come to the conclusion I am definitely not a YouTube star. So um, it's been a learning curve for me, which has been great because there's been a whole lot of new learning for the teachers as well as the students. And then this year I created a website um, to uh, outline all of the students' work and, uh, or not work, but the courses. And that's sort of a, a work in progress as we go. Um, and then social emotional learning. Um, art is social emotional learning. There is, it is just encompasses it completely. Everything you do from conception to production and beyond involves self-awareness, self-management social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. It's all part of the creative process. So they go hand in hand. But some of the things we've been specifically working on at the high school has been, um, a how do you feel today? So you can see my two um, images on the right every day. The students have a, uh, a Google form to fill out with an image and they pick which image they feel closely to. So we've done a lot of different animals and then of course Barney Fife. Uh, most of them don't know who Barney Fife is, but, um, and then, so they take a few minutes at the beginning. Um, we go through them, I leaf through them to kind of gauge where the students are throughout the day. Most, most of what I get is kind of that they're tired or wanted to sleep in or things like that. But um, just to see if there's any red flags. Um, the weekly sketchbook journal, um, they draw to a prompt. Usually it has something to do with social emotional learning and they hand that in, in weekly um, and that's all for, also through Google Slides. Uh, the one-on-one -on -one breakouts really allows me to check in and see how the kids are doing and 
um, after the um, events of the beginning of the month, um, a couple of kids had questions and things like that that they felt more comfortable talking one-on-one -on -one about with me. And then again, student choice has been a huge thing about um, uh, social emotional learning. Um, student engagement, um, the students um, have really embraced the choice in a lot of ways. There's still exhibit opportunities for um, uh, students. We just uh, got the results of the Scholastic Art Awards, um, which students were, uh, had their work um, entered into. Um, the one-on-one -on -one student breakouts has done a lot for engagement and also the written ref reflections. And uh, one, uh, we've been doing a lot of social justice artwork. Um, and so this is examples from three different courses. The one in the middle is from the art discovery class where they did a unity flag, um, uh, social justice or social issue unity flag. The one on the left is from the art three class where they had to create uh, mixed media, social justice slash social issue piece, um, which needed to include collage element. And the one on the right is um, from one of my AP students, uh, sustained investigation that has to do with um, uh, identity as a black woman. Um, and this is a quote that I got from one of those reflections today um, when I was grading some work and it fit in Absolutely, and this is directly from one of my art discovery students. She says, I'm not usually so committed to artwork pieces, but this is one I, re I really was. Maybe it's because I can relate to this, but I love doing this project and what I learned from it. So I was like, I was overjoyed when I read that. Whoops. It's on slides. And then the rewards and challenges. So um, challenges, um, connecting with some students, especially without their cameras on has been a huge challenge. Um, and some students have not checked in at all and other students have relished in it. And um, so that's been uh, connecting with the students who, who aren't as um, great about sticking on their cameras or being conversational has really been a challenge. Um, Access to materials, especially for the remote learners. We've mostly been working in our sketchbooks, um, but with the advanced students, uh, it was easy with the cohorts to get them their, their artwork and they would carry their pieces back and forth. These are two large pieces here that are 16 um, by 20. But when um, with the unity flag, there were a lot of students at home. So they were able to pick them up at the high school. And then um, I actually delivered artwork to our materials to kids' houses who didn't have a, them. Technology has been a challenge, especially um, with trying to um, show the students in class because I can't have them gather around and share with the students at home at the same time. That's been kind of a challenge that we've been working on, um, being able to do demonstrations for both groups of kids at the same time as if they were in the same room. That's um, one thing we struggled with. Um, not knowing who will be in the classroom, a lot of kids are deciding, you know, some days we have eight in a classroom, some days we have zero in the classroom and everybody's online. So not knowing um, has been a little bit of a challenge in order to plan. Time has not, um, for both planning and grading, uh, you would think there's more time, but there isn't. Um, and then time for meeting with students, those one-on-one -on -one breakouts take a lot of class. And the lack of time, um, a vertical connection within the art department. Um, you know, I have this first time I've seen Becky really all year. Um, so that, that's been a struggle, but there's been um, a huge amount of rewards as well. Um, the learning and the professional development for us as teachers has been huge. And there's so many things that I've learned um, that I can incorporate, you know, past COVID and then um, connecting, you know, as much as that's been a challenge, that's also been a reward, focusing more on pro um, process and then um, recreating and creating new lessons that connect more with students and um, learning more about what the students are thinking um, through the written reflections has also really been a reward because Sometimes they'll share things that way that they won't share verbally. So, and 
that's it. So unshare. Andrea, thank you so much. It, you know, I was reflecting upon some of the conversations uh, I had with um, some of you over the summer during office hours as we were um, starting to look towards the hybrid model and really reflected on, you know, the great questions you asked, but how far you've come and the amazing innovative ideas and the artwork that you both shared tonight um, is really pretty incredible um, given, you know, where we're at and the creativity. Um, so thank you guys for that. Yeah. I just want to add that um, I know the middle school isn't here, but they have their own, you know, um, instructional process and things that are happening over at the middle school. And so, um, you know, it's hard to to not have them here. They're they're a huge part of, you know, what we do. And as the kids move forward up to through into the high school. Yeah, good point. Um, please know it was just for time. We have a lot of agenda items and picking just a couple people to represent their different departments. Um, but you're exactly right. Um, it looks slightly different at, at each school and each level. Um, board members, any questions for Becky or Andrea? Because um, I've, I've promised everybody after their agenda item, they can sign off. So any questions you guys might have for them? Sally, I have one for Andrea. Andrea, what did, when you were mentioning that some kids just haven't engaged yet, they just- yeah. it's, they And it seems to be across the board when we discuss it with the other teachers that they have. They, I've got several students who log on to, and they're there, but they never turn on their camera or respond verbally. Um, and some who have, you know, chosen not to hand in work. And so it's a struggle, I think, you know, those kids would benefit probably more from being in school than being remote learners. And it's, um, I'm sure the other high school teachers have probably experienced the same thing with certain students where they just are not connecting um, with any of us. Um, and it's been hard to be able to, you know, as many emails that go home or phone calls that go home, they're, you know, sometimes there just is no response. And it's, it's, it's difficult now we're getting to the end of the first semester and there's some kids who have just really not embraced, um, you know, being involved in school. Thank you. Any other questions? Jim? Yeah, I think it's a great job. And it looks like there's some techniques that you can use even when, you know, when the kids are back in the classroom. So it's really, uh, it's really good. So I appreciate all the hard work. Well, Becky, Andrea, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate the overview and the and tremendous amount of work you're putting forward for our students. So thank you guys so much for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you. Us. Um, so we're going to move on to the music department. Uh, we have three representatives here from the music department. I'm going to uh, introduce the three of them and then turn over to Michael. So we have Michael Bowles, um, instrumental teacher from Wethersfield High School, Emily Caravella, um, elementary um, instrumental, and Steve Cofrancesco, who is elementary general or vocal music. Um, so we'll hear a little bit about instructional strategies and what does it look like to teaching in the remote model. So Michael, I'll turn over to you. All right, well, thank you very much. And, and thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I'm really grateful to get a chance to talk to this group of folks just about um, secondary music, um, you know, kind of both vocal, instrumental and, and how it looks um, in, the, in the world that we're in right now. Um, I'm gonna kind of just talk a little bit about um, some social emotional learning and classroom community first. It's something that we've really focused on. Um, something we've really tried to, to integrate, uh, integrate is really um, communicating with each student every day. And I know that sounds really simple, um, but actually with a large group and a large class, it's, it's sometimes very hard and it's, it's a lot easier in person. But taking the time to reach out to those students one by one, um, and like Andrea alluded to earlier, um, you know, at the high school, there are some students who are you know, not engaged um, on the digital platform. They'll log into the Google Meet, and there are a couple of students this year I've never seen their face or heard their voice. Um, and so it, it's a little hard to reach out to those, but some of those kids um, are really benefiting from some of the more private ways that we can reach out and communicate. In this environment, um, it's, it's a little bit difficult to unmute your microphone and talk to a whole group of people, and it can be very intimidating for a high school student. So the ability to um, take them into a breakout room or chat through GoGuardian is really helpful, um, but that only really works when all of the students are you know, logged onto their Chromebook or we can talk to them through GoGuardian or they're logging in and communicating in the classroom. 
Um, we're really, um, I focused a lot on building classroom community and this year have integrated um, a lot of levels of group communication and team communication in between students and myself. And so students are divided up into squads and these squads um, work throughout the quarter and semesters um, on group projects, communicating with each other, um, sharing out their, their music, um, playing for each other, critiquing each other, but really is a small group within the larger group because instrumental music, and not necessarily instrumental, but large ensemble music really is about the community in the group. And that is the thing most affected by the pandemic right now is we're not all able to be in the same room doing the same thing at the same time. And that's why a lot of these students um, engage in music so effectively at the secondary level, um, because that's the place where they, they feel like they belong. And so I've tried to, to implement another level where they can connect with more of their peers. Um, this opportunity has kind of, this has given us the opportunity to focus on um, other areas of music education that we talk about in conjunction with performance. Um, you know, at the secondary level, we are focused on performing in band, orchestra, and choir, and putting on community performances and working towards sort of that end goal every semester. Um, and we touch on topics like, um, you know, music theory, music history, and appreciation throughout that time. But now that is really the driving force of our curriculum. Um, because that is what we're, we're able to do the most in, you know, the virtual model, the hybrid model, and even the remote model. Um, students have a lot of say in what we're doing, and so they're getting to pick projects, pick composers, um, really drive their instruction a little bit in that regard, um, which is really great for some student buy-in and choice. Um, and it's really created, you know, a, a positive culture among the peers. You know, we were, today we were taking attendance. It took like 20 minutes because we got sidetracked talking about musicals, um, but it was at least a conversation around a group of kids that was music related, and a lot of them engaged and really um, became involved in it. Today, I just noticed that that's really what you know, I miss the most is just the little interactions with students in and out of class. It's not necessarily repeating measure four for the fourth time, um, but it's, you know, getting them to meet and interact in that social level. And, and the high school students in particular have done a really good job of keeping that culture alive. And, and I want to just credit them to their tenacity and perseverance in this because it's, it's really them that are keeping music education going right now and keeping it in that positive environment as much as it is the teachers. And we have a really um, great group of students that have done that. We had a lot of successes this year in the fall um, with marching band. We were able to at least put on, you know, some sort of season and performance opportunity for them while we didn't compete or anything. And we did do a, a short halftime show at a couple of sporting events we don't normally get to play at. Um, you know, normally we're Friday night band, but we showed up at a couple of JV soccer games and field hockey and stuff we've never done um, to, to perform. And, and they really enjoyed that. And we were able to have um, a student night for all of those seniors, which I, I really enjoyed. Um, some of the challenges we're facing really um, circle around the health challenges that we're here. And, you know, this is one of the more, you know, high risk activities that has a lot of state guidance um, on it. And if you haven't if you haven't read Addendum 7, I highly encourage you to go through it to get a little bit of an understanding about the obstacles that students are facing. Um, it pretty much eliminates large ensemble music in any capacity inside a building. And that has been really hard on our students. Um, they put on a brave face. Um, when we were in the fall and we had some better weather, we were outside to play a little bit more. Um, but now that it's cold, playing is fairly limited. Um, 12 feet apart in the building with a mask, with a bell cover or an instrument cover. And so the band room at the high school, the largest music room we have, you can get about 12 kids. Um, and so with a class of 35 or 40, that doesn't really um, provide an opportunity even to explore that. And so they realize that and that kind of, um, that's hard to work through. And so we're, we're limited by that experience. And so we've had to really come back at curriculum and build the ship as we go. And I know everybody's heard that phrase, but in this subject area, I think more than most, it's not so much adapting the curriculum that we've done. We already burned that and let that go. Um, we've had to really develop it as we go along and create a musical experience that we've never done um, and still engage students. And for the most part, they are engaged, but they are really missing what they're doing. I mean, what they signed up for, you know, they, a lot of them worked for 10 years to play in their senior concert. Um, and, you know, we had a group that missed it last year and a group this year um, to try and build in some of that experience for them is really kind of my top priority moving through this semester because we, we have a strong music tradition across the board in Weathersfield and to see the band orchestra and choir students take this with such maturity, I think is the word I'm looking for and really just come at it from a positive attitude. I've, I haven't had a single upperclassman leave, quit, change their mind about music. They're still sticking with it. 
even in through the semester. And that, that really is a testament to their love for it. And we're working toward giving them something that they can really enjoy, whether it's a virtual or in-person, if it's limited. Um, and so it's, it's been quite an adventure and quite a journey. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what they can pull off this year. I'm going to buy myself a coffee mug that says you're on mute. That's what I'm going to use. Um, so Michael, thank you for that reflection. Uh, and really from um, the, the viewpoint of the students, um, their tenacity, perseverance, and thank you for your leadership and your engagement with those students um, and keeping their love of music alive. Um, Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about elementary instrumental. I'm not on mute now. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me tonight. I really um, am excited to update you on the progress of our students during these challenging times. And as you know, Mike just said, we were tasked with teaching instrumental music without instruments is essentially the um, task of the school year when we were reading Addendum 7 and just all of the safety guidelines that rightfully need to be in place at schools at this time. Um, the hybrid model is giving instrumental music at the elementary level a different advantage, we actually are teaching them 100% remotely on their home days. So we do have face-to-face -face, um, instruction with the children playing instruments. They're just at home so that it's safe to do so. Um, so this has been giving me the ability to teach synchronous lesson groups, um, you know, playing instruments safely and providing a stable, stable schedule that worked in both the hybrid and full remote. So when school needs to switch, the kids lesson times are exactly the same. So um, it's definitely not a normal year, but it is closer to normal because now at least we're on a screen, but we are back to having lesson groups. You know, we're no longer asynchronous. We're seeing kids, we're working on lesson material. Um, and, and that's a really awesome thing and is really good for motivation. Um, and the face-to-face -face time is really good because um, we deal with beginners. I mean, we're teaching fourth graders remotely who've never touched an instrument ever before. So. Um, Andrea, you maybe think of YouTube stars. Um, the instrumental music department got together and we made beginner YouTube videos because it's really important for students to have resources for both when they're on screen with me and then to get back to. And there's a lot on YouTube and we really wanted them to have a very good model of their specific instrument. And I had a fourth grader adamant that his flute was being taught by a YouTube lady. And every week I would come in and I would teach him the lesson that he saw on the YouTube link that was me. Um, and every week would say, how did you know that the YouTube lady said that? And it, it took me a couple of weeks, but I was wearing different glasses during the recordings of the video. And I think that's what happened. But if you want to feel like a YouTube star, you should go down to elementary. They'll make you feel quickly like, you know, your star. <laughs> Otherwise, students use smart music, which is district provided to access their weekly lesson materials. This is an awesome program because it actually makes their sheet music interactive. They can click a note, it'll tell them what it should sound like, what it should um, play like, how they should play it, and it adapts to each instrument. So I don't need to do that adapting for them, which is great because we have to do a lot of other adapting. Um, Students have actually been selecting their own music and their own solos, whether it's video game music that's really popular right now, or movie themes, um, or composing their own music. And we can actually insert that into their smart music accounts, which will make that interactive for them as well. So that's been a really massive motivator for them and has really um, gave me the ability to personalize their learning to what they're interested in, which is, you know, um, the goal in all formats, pandemic or not. Um, our first year strings are currently getting their bow licenses, which is a really big deal this time of year. They actually are graduating from plucking the strings with their finger to going with the bow. And we do get a legitimate license for this. So that's a major curricular milestone that we're really proud of. Um, you know, one of the unique things about this year is that when an instrument breaks, it needs to then go get put into quarantine and then repaired and then quarantined and sent back to the student. So repairs are so much longer than they would have been or even the transfer of inventory is, is very difficult. Um, so when one of us has an instrument maintenance issue, we actually all stop and learn how to fix that issue together. We try our best to fix it you know, right on the meat so it doesn't have to go anywhere. And you know, what that's translating to is elementary students are learning how to maintenance their own instrument, which is not something I generally talk about with elementary students and is quite frankly, not the easiest task. 
but we all are learning a lot through the process. I'm learning to really describe things and show things. The students are learning. And um, I'm starting to realize that when students hear a sound that, you know, something's messed up on an instrument, they're starting to jump in, you know, fix your reed, change the valve, you know, all the valves need to face the mouthpiece. Like they're getting it. And these are fourth graders that have never played an instrument before. So that's really, really exciting. Um, I like to think of this year more as an investment rather than that we're learning or like we're losing learning or we're moving slowly because that's an investment of skills right there. I mean, when we eventually get to ensembles, students might be able to fix and tune their own instruments or at least more of them, you know, before a pandemic, I was tuning about 90 violins before we could even get started, which I'm pretty fast, but not that fast. So I think that's something that's going to be really powerful and, and really making them independent in the future. Um, it's empowering them as well. Um, my students are also as supportive of each other online as they are in person, which is really nice to see, you know, when somebody finally tunes their instrument, which honestly takes a lot of physical strength and, you know, just listening skills to do, we all kind of give each other like a virtual high five, which looks like that. We do not hit the Chromebooks off the table. That's a rule. So don't worry. Um, on holiday weeks, we have to figure out how to cram all of our instrumental students into, um, like the half day schedule, which with the amount of students that we teach in instrumental ensembles is never really easy um, for a schedule. So what we've done is we've changed to rehearsal game days. We all look forward to these because we actually get to see the full band and orchestra together online. The Google Meet is about as packed as our pre-COVID stages and we really miss that. The activities we do focus on music literacy, trivia and rhythmic awareness through platforms such as Kahoot, Google Polls and Jamboard. Most recently, we played an Among Us themed Find the Imposter music rhythm game on Pear Deck. Pear Deck is an add-on that makes your Google Slides interactive. It's a great way to get that informal set assessment back into your online lessons, and it's fun for the students. These rehearsal games are so important because it, um, it builds our community building, right? Um, in fact, there's been several moments where the online environment has felt really close to in-person instruction. It's awesome to see the students talking and laughing at each other while they're playing. Um, it feels like band and orchestra rehearsal where we are verbally and non-verbally finding ways to support, challenge, and communicate with each other. Leadership, teamwork, and SEL skills are naturally adjust within the music education curriculum. And although it looks different virtually, my students are finding ways to express themselves and lead through their music. Students have chosen to perform Zoom concerts for their family and friends. They've specifically learned their baby siblings' favorite song to play with them on their instruments. Um, they use Flipgrid to give each other positive feedback on their performances and compositions. One of our awesome percussionists took the time to record Jingle Bell Rock for our holiday sing-along that was virtually shared with the entire <laughs> Another one of our percussionists is currently preparing a virtual audition to represent Emerson Williams in the CMEA Northern Region Middle School Music Festival. So although things look a lot different this year, we're still finding ways to make music and, and make the most of what is happening and most importantly, in the safest way possible. Um, another challenge that we've experienced this year, pre-COVID, many big ticket items such as bass, percussion, and the auxiliary wind instruments were shared between students and sometimes even schools. Not only could inventory no longer be shared, but we needed to double the inventory to provide instruments for the students at home. WPS Music was awarded over $16,000 of instruments and mouthpieces via the Con Selmer COVID matching grant program. This allowed us to get 11 instruments into the hands of students and sets of mouthpieces for all seven schools. Emerson Williams was also recently awarded a Horns for Kids trombone, a program that refurbishes instruments and donates them back to schools. This year, we've been able to provide 100% of our students first choice instruments at Emerson if they were in need. With instrument repairs and inventory transferring requiring those extra quarantine protocol protocols, having the inventory to support students' needs, especially during these times, is important. I'm committed to finding ways to make sure students continue to get what they need and that all students are receiving a safe and equitable access to music education. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Oh, you're great, Emily. Wow. Thanks. Nice work. Um, so I'm going to introduce Steve Cofrancesco from um, Highcrest to talk a little bit about general or vocal music, um, which also looks considerably different um, in the hybrid model. So Steve? 
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me um, and having us all here. It's been a joy to listen to my colleagues speak about their innovative ways. It's been really inspiring and I'm going last and I hope that I uh, keep the ball going. Um, but um, again, my name is Steve Co-Francesco. I teach general music at Highcrest um, and I was uh, interested in giving you guys a little bit of a snapshot of how my classroom functions in the K through six uh, music realm. Um, going back, um, this summer, I, I kind of had to, as we all did, uh, reimagine and reinvent the curriculum that we have, or as Mike said, kind of just throw some stuff out and, and kind of rebuild as we went. Um, so I was kind of inspired to really go back to the, to the music standards um, and kind of envision how those could work in any capacity. Um, so for those who are unaware, the three main standards in music are create, perform and respond. And then there's connect, which is kind of just like how those three things intermingle with each other. So I um, really set about what is creating look like in this class, in this class, in this class, what does performing look like in these classes and what does responding uh, look like, sound like in those classes. So I kind of have split up my, um, my focus to the younger grades and the older grades. So the younger grades are, in my opinion, K through two, and then the older grades are three through six. So for K through two, I think this is where a lot of the, the biggest struggles and challenges come with, because obviously that's where we do the most singing. We sing every, every day, like all parts of class is involved with singing. And obviously we cannot do that as Mike had alluded to, um, it is unsafe unless you are 12 feet away in a properly ventilated space with masks on. Um, and so uh, even when I went outside, I was lucky enough that we had enough space at Highcrest where there was like a designated spot outside for just music and we spray painted uh, little white dots on the grass and they were all 14 feet away so that like we had, we had the facility and it was just logistically didn't make a lot of sense. The kids were so far away from each other wearing their masks that I couldn't hear them. They couldn't hear me. I was shouting just to try and to get them. And I didn't even know if they were singing the right thing. So um, it was, it's really a logistical uh, hardship to try and get them to sing. Um, so I'm really, I've, I've kind of had to change my focus to instead of singing, we're doing a lot of speaking. All the songs that I would normally do, we kind of just speak in rhythm. And then I have a, a recording of someone or of me later on uh, singing it so they can at least use their ears to listen to uh, what it sounds like sung. Um, the kids at home, whenever we had a remote Wednesday, I would send all those videos out so they would get a chance to sing along at home. But they, I gotta give them credit, the younger kids, they understand so well that like, oh, I'm, I'm not allowed to sing right now because that will put me and my friends in danger. So I really, I've been so impressed, especially with the younger kids, they just get it. They really understand, I need to keep my mask on, I need to stay far away and I can't sing right now because that would make me and others unsafe. <clears throat> so we do a lot of listening and we do a lot of movement activities. It's all about movement. And I am using movement to kind of facilitate those three areas, creating, performing, and responding. So um, I'll put on a song and I'll say, listen to the lyrics, listen to the volume, listen to the speed. And I want you to make a movement that you think embodies what you're hearing or um, that kind of relates also to responding and how would you uh, look at your partner and mirror what they're doing and all this kind of stuff uh, across the room or on the screen you have like we do have some screen buddies where like one person in class has one person on the screen and they have to watch each other and kind of mirror each other. Um, so movement is big for the younger kids. Um, <clears throat> because it's a 45 minute class and so much of my class is typically taken up with singing and uh, that's kind of gone now. Um, I've kind of taken the time to look for ways to reinforce other curricular areas as well. So I focus in a lot on math, literacy, and art, um, believe it or not. So the structure of a typical younger grades class is we'll do attendance every day and I will start every class with a go around, which is kind of just like a, a silly little question. A lot of the times the kids will come up with them themselves. They sometimes have to do with music, they sometimes don't. Um, it could be anything from what's your favorite color to what did you do this weekend to what's your favorite song right now. Um, and every time I go down the list of people, they answer. And so that's another way that I build community. Um, <clears throat> and we make a big deal when like somebody did the same thing that another person did over the weekend. Um, and that just kind of makes them feel like they're having a dialogue with each other and everyone's getting a chance to speak right at the beginning of class to feel like they're being heard. Um, so that's important to me. <clears throat> Then we do our songs of whatever we're focusing in on the day. I've been trying 
to, for example, in kindergarten, I have a big unit about the farm. Um, so today our music was all about pigs and we were uh, moving and grooving to some pig songs and doing some finger plays with our fingers so that they can still work on their fine motor skills. Um, and then while those songs were playing in the background, I'll actually take out whiteboards and I'll do like a little directed drawing, uh, which I learned about for uh, when I worked with the summer school class program this summer. Um, I taught the kindergarten class with Emily and another uh, friend, and we had a great time. And that was something that I really enjoyed and they really enjoyed. And so it's, it's a cool way, I think, for them to reinforce listening to a song while you're focusing on doing something artistic. I have found that they they memorize things so quickly when they're doing multitasking um, with like multiple artistic processes happening at the same time. So that's been great. And I always end uh, the younger kids class with some kind of some kind of story, either from Epic, which is um, a site that we have a subscription to as a district, or um, anything that I can find in our library. And I'll take a video of it, so it's me reading it, so um, they feel kind of like everyone's listening to the same thing. And a lot of the um, stories that I typically read are about whatever we're learning about. Like today we read a story about a pig in a band, um, but they also have a lot of SEL messages as well. So that's something that we, right after the end of the story, before we log out, we kind of talk about how do we connect all those things that we did today? How do we connect our song to our drawing, to our story? And what do we take away from that? So that's something that I've, I've been really enjoying uh, that structure and they, they know what comes next, which is really uh, good for them to have that kind of stability. Um, and just routine in such a time where routine is so hard to, uh, to have. Um, for the older grades, three through six, um, we start every day. Um, I, I'll try and share my screen. I'm on my iPad right now. <laughs> I don't usually share my screen on my iPad, so I think it will work. You'll have to let me know um, if it doesn't work. All right, let's start. Oh, I'm sorry. Me... That's a nice picture of you. Is it working? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, not yet, Steve. Yeah. All right. If it doesn't work, I can just talk through it. Sorry, I'm not good on my iPad and my my computer. That's stuff. okay. You're not Google. using you're not used to using Zoom every day either. I'm really not, man. If this we, is Google, does I anyone have a does anyone have a six year old child handy that can help him out here? No, I, no, I just got a silly dog. I was no, I was um, kidding there, guys. <laughs> Um, so anyways, we do something that's called a matrix and um, this is three through six. Um, so basically what a matrix is, is a way to read rhythms in uh, on standard notation. Um, so it basically is um, a, a number of beats going across the top um, and X's all throughout uh, under each number of beats and each uh, X corresponds to a different number. So if there's one X, it's a quarter note. If it's two X, it's, it's two eighth notes and so on and so forth. Um, and that's a way that um, I've kind of gotten everybody on a level playing field because we all left in March last year and who knows who remembers what. And it's very hard to teach everybody um, when they're all at different levels. So I kind of entered on a level playing field. Everyone can start learning this together. It's kind of a new thing. And the one thing that I've really had a lot of success with in terms of not only community, but also accessibility is um, homemade instruments. So um, every student needs to have something that they can strike, something that they can shake and something that they can scrape. Um, so those uh, will change depending on where they are um, in their homes, in another space, in their desks or whatever. Um, so it's very fun watching them. Uh, I try and challenge them, find something that nobody else has um, and you'll win a prize, which is like a silent chair. But um, uh, that's been fun for them to kind of explore with how do I make something into music and how do I change mechanisms of my own playing how is this different from this and how can I still play the same rhythms while controlling my body differently um, so that's been great um, for the fifth and sixth graders something that's really been fantastic um, obviously we don't have chorus this year which is a big loss um, but what I've been doing is we do uh, in the fifth and sixth grade classes we've um, done kind of a unit all about um, selecting repertoire for performance, which is uh, actually a standard that I truly have trouble uh, teaching during a normal um, during a normal year because it's kind of like oh the concert here it comes these are the songs that I picked um, so it's been it's been interesting for them to come like to my side of the table and see like oh okay so first I need to make a set of criteria and they came up with all the criteria for the song they wanted to sing 
then we're going to suggest songs and we have a big list and then we're going to vote and we're going to we use flipgrid as well they all made a flipgrid video and they explained uh with multiple reasons why they think their song should be the song that we do it fits the criteria uh -huh. this way whatever we have a, a vote so we're uh, working on democracy as well um and then uh we had a song chosen that we're going to sing in every class and so they use flipgrid um to put in their headphones and they just sing um they sing the song that they chose the section that we chose and i'm putting it all together the district and uh thank you so much sarah harris uh, was uh kind enough to get us the apple music bundle which has uh logic which is a fantastic professional like recording software as well as final cut which is a professional like movie making software so i did the uh the classic virtual choir where you put everybody in boxes and so i've done that for seven classes so far with multiple songs and they get very excited to see themselves um and a huge plus for me is that i'm getting to hear all these kids sing by themselves um, which would never, ever, ever happen in um, in a fifth and sixth grade chorus where I have 70 kids in each one, um, unless they're very motivated and very confident, which is kind of hard to find um, in fifth and sixth grade singing. So um, that's been awesome. And I, I found some, some kids who are maybe not super engaged in chorus during a normal year who have like the most unbelievable voices that I am really in awe of. So that's been great. Um, for responding for the older grades, they, one of their flip grade assignments was to talk about their favorite song and why. And so I've been actually taking their favorite songs and we've been playing them in class, but then I've been finding ways to talk about the elements of music. So we talk about the dynamics, we talk about the tempo, we talk about the form, like verse, chorus, where's the pre-chorus, where's the bridge, all this kind of stuff. So it's been great for us to respond to what we're hearing and uh, give students, uh, like had Mike had said before, it gives them ownership saying, oh, this is awesome. This is a song I know. This is a song that I really like listening to. And now I know a little bit more about it and I can speak about it um, musically. And then creating uh, the district has been fantastic. Again, um, two fantastic softwares that we use are Flat and Soundtrap. So Flat is a music notation software where students can literally type in their own notes, choose their instruments, and then it will play it for you like a virtual orchestra. So they've been really enjoying that. And then Soundtrap is a relatively new thing that we're kind of piloting with just 50 students um, at, per school. Um, and for me personally, and I know uh, I can echo the sentiments of the other uh, general music teachers, we're having a blast with it. It is so cool. It is basically like a big loop software. So there are these little sections of bass, of drums, of piano, of whatever. And you can kind of layer them on top of each other and make your own kind of tracks, which they think is the coolest thing ever. And we've had really cool, I got to give a uh, big credit to Giselle Ziegler, who is the web um, music teacher. She has the best soundtrack project. She has them making ringtone. She has them doing um, jazz, like creating jazz loops. And she has them, um, the next thing that we're going to do, I'm trying to remember, we have all these different scenarios that uh, we're coming up with together as a team, which has been fantastic for Soundtrap and the kids are eating it up. Um, so um, I had kind of mentioned SEL, yeah. So I can finish up with challenges and rewards. Sorry, I'm kind of rambling. Um, a big challenge, as I mentioned, is we cannot sing. Um, I am a little worried about the program's future um, with kids that are not learning how to sing safely at the moment. That's gonna be a little bit of legwork um, as we continue to progress through the years, but also just keeping them engaged. I don't want to set a precedent of, oh, we just listen to music in music class. I want them to be actively engaged and involved in the singing and making of sounds and music. Um, so that's something that's always in the back of my mind. And it's something that um, I'm going to continue to focus in on as much as I can, as safely as we can with Addendum 7 and everything else. Um, lastly, movement restrictions as we look to go back to full in and rather than hybrid, I'm sure that is hopefully on everybody's mind. And um, when it happens, I just know that uh, in the younger kids, movement has been such a successful thing for me. And now with more and more kids in the same space, uh, movement is going to be restricted. So that's something that coming up on the future, coming up uh, yeah, on the horizon is something I'm a little worried about. And we'll have to continue to speak with my colleagues about ideas for that. Um, but as, as Echo, there are a lot of rewards. Um, all these technologies that we have are amazing. I will absolutely continue to use Flat and Soundtrap and Flipgrid um, through the rest of my career, probably. They are really, really useful tools. Um, as I mentioned, individual singing in the upper grades has been fantastic. And uh, lastly, um, the mini lesson kind of platform or format where we do the 10 to 15 minute lesson 
I stay on the Google Meet, everyone goes and does their own thing. Um, and if they have questions, they come back or they leave and come back and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's been fantastic because not only am I getting kind of like small group time with either the people that are in class, I can go around and there's less people to manage and I can work with them more closely or um, the kids that don't need the help. It's really amazing to see how much they grasp and they, they, they leave after 10 minutes. I'm like, well, you left already, but then they show me what they worked on it. And I was like, okay, you didn't need my help at all. Um, so that's, it's been really um, interesting and gratifying to see. So that's kind of. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Steve, the music teacher. Thank you so much. I, you know, um, I'm, I'm a, a optimism, but I think that silver lining is, and I think you've all said it, you know, it's really, Teaching, teaching the music standards differently. And while it's not their kind of typical musical experience, um, um, both music and art department are really, um, really sparking student interests in different ways and, and silver lining. Our students, um, I really believe are learning a lot of different skills they wouldn't have learned traditionally. Um, and it will really, um, so I think the learning is there, but looks very different. Um, and again, different for different students. So thank you guys for that. Um, Board of Ed members, any questions for our music teachers? Sally, I just wanted to mention, I think it was Emily who said that don't think of it as lost time, think of it as investing in the future. I thought that was a wonderful way of saying this year because it is so different. Um, we're learning so much more um, in technology and how we can use it with our children. But at the same time, we're so worried that we're slowing them down and they're missing out. But if you think of it as investing and teaching them things that they can have as a base, I think we've got the right attitude. Thanks, yeah. that was a great line. Music teachers, thank you so much. Actually, you guys are gonna stay and talk a little bit about festival as a club. So we're gonna move on to uh, number three. Um, we have uh, four teachers from the high school and actually, um, um, Michael, Emily, and Steven are part of the elementary festival um, opportunity. So they're gonna talk a little bit about the reimagining of festival. So we have Joanne Riccardi, Joe Kess, Courtney Bradley, and Ben Sikora here uh, to talk a little bit about how they reimagined uh, their club or clubs at Weathersfield High School. So uh, Joanne, would you start us off? Take your time. Okay, we're good. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. Uh, I appreciate that. And um, I really do appreciate I want to say the um, investment in the DECA club. Um, I know that it's really the support um, from everyone from the school, the board members, everyone. Um, DECA, for those of you who don't know, um, is a marketing club, but really a business club. And it really is a great place for business students who have similar interests to connect. They love it, <laughs> um, which is great. Um, it does look a little bit different this year. It really does. Um, I'm going to just talk a, a couple of the things that we've done um, and things that the students have also been involved with. Um, at the local level, we have had the luxury of meeting on Wednesdays um, during the remote day. I've had really great participation. We meet every Wednesday um, at 12.30 um, with different agendas. Um, we've talked a little bit about competition this year, but uh, I think competition might, at the state level, might take a, a back seat. Um, we did still conduct our food drive this year. Uh, students decorated their boxes from home. Um, they made their posters from home, um, encouraged classmates to bring in food. Um, and then I had a group who actually went down, um, collected food in the school and then and brought it down and we, really successful, it was good. Um, also, we've had um, guest speakers um, to our Google Meets, which has been nice. Um, last week, we had the state officers um, attend our Google um, Meet, and they um, well, they talked to students about leadership, but they also helped them um, with interviewing skills and also with um, sales skills, believe it or not. Um, I loved it because it was students teaching students. So that's been great. Um, at the state level, um, Connecticut DECA um, has had several uh, meetings with students um, and have, has really given them, have, have given them a great opportunity to meet students from other schools. I love that they stepped up this year and did that. 
Um, sometimes I think the students right now through the whole COVID thing um, feel a little bit isolated. Um, they don't even get to see their friends on a daily basis. So this was a great opportunity for my students to meet students from other schools. Um, it was, they loved it. They had a great time. There was games, um, different learning opportunities again, and they've probably met at a state level three or four times. So, and I've had excellent, excellent feedback um, from that. So I really loved that opportunity. Just getting outside of their four walls, connecting with other students um, who have similar um, interests. Um, for state competition, again, I'm not 100% sure what we're going to be doing with that. State DECA has gone to a virtual format, as has national DECA. Um, I have a couple students who are interested and will really finalize that this week. So we'll be doing that. Um, one thing that um, has was, I guess, last week, have, every day I'm like, oh, is, is this working? Is it not working? But I think anytime um, we can get kids to connect um, through an interest, is great. Um, I loved last week was one of my favorite moments. Um, we had a meeting um, and my president said, Mr. Ricardo, we want to play Kahoot. Great. So she developed a Kahoot game business categories. <laughs> so I don't know how much fun that is for, for a lot of kids, but she invited the kids. We had 17 students attend. Um, and I love that I heard giggles. Um, to hear giggles from high school students is heartwarming. Well, we can't even get them to turn on our mics sometimes. So I thought, ah, that's good. Social emotional learning. Um, we got them to laugh. We got them to have a little bit of fun. Um, a little break from their daily, maybe ho-hums every day. So I'm happy with that. I do like the virtual meetings, I have to say. I've had a lot of students attend, otherwise couldn't attend because they were working or had sports. Um, so there's a lot of things, even at the club level, um, we've had to kind of make changes through COVID, but the changes have worked nicely for the club. Um, so that's... That's kind of what we're doing right now. Um, does anyone have any questions about our DECA group? Thanks, thanks again for the support. It's been, it, it's, it's a great place for the kids. It great. really is. Thank you. Joanne, well, thank you so much for sharing that. We appreciate that. And it's exciting to see students interacting again in a time that's so isolating for our adults and our students to provide those interactions and um, fun moments. So thank you for that. I agree, thank you. Yeah. Joe Kess, I will turn it over to you. Oh, you're still on mute, Joe. Uh, I'm gonna get one of those coffee mugs too, Sally. So I'm gonna be talking about the Skills 21 group. Uh, this is gonna be our fourth year. It actually started as uh, a lot of things related to computer science here have started with the help of uh, Ralph Morelli, who some of you may know, Professor Emeritus now at a Trinity College in computer science. He, I, I was talking to him about different ways to get more girls involved into computer science. Um, by the way, just blatant plug, we'll throw this out there. We have had our first graduate get her PhD in computer science. Um, it was tremendously fun. She invited me to her presentation because it was done on Zoom. So uh, oh, that, that, was a, that was a thrill, but anyway. Um, and so uh, Ralph Morelli got us in touch with uh, Skills 21, which had a grant that was specifically designed to get underrepresented kids involved in computer science. So we do it now as an after-school club. Most schools who do it, do it as part of their curriculum. It's like uh, they have an engineering course or, or something and they do it during the day. My kids do it on their own time. Um, they work, there's a bunch of different categories. There's, there's engineering, there's video and media, there's entrepreneurship. Ton, we compete in the computer science challenge, my, my teams. Um, and basically they work on developing an app through the year. Uh, the app usually has some sort of a theme to it, but it's usually a very, very broad based theme. They've done apps related to conservation of endangered species, school bus safety, um, this year they're working on, uh, last year they worked on apps related to uh, dyslexia um, and autism. This year they're working on 
software for car safety. Um, so, the, you know, things like that. Um, they work all year developing the app, developing a website that goes along with it. Uh, there, during non-COVID years, there are two field trips. We go to uh, basement systems, you know, the Everything Basementy guy is one of these sponsors and the kids take a trip there and hold meetings, uh, hear a lot about entrepreneurship there. Uh, we go to IBM, uh, they, they give us a space there. And then it culminates in the spring at the uh, Oakdale Toyota Theater, whatever it's called, depending on how old you are. Um, and kids from all across the state are there competing, giving presentations to a panel of, of experts. Um, but also what they do is they man booths. So it's basically like a trade show. Every team has to man a booth and to the judges and the general public who come by, you know, explain what their project is. Um, and they and the kids get to meet hundreds of other kids all doing slightly different topics in different categories. It's, it's fantastic. Um, the kids have loved it. They've done well, like everybody else. It's been a COVID year, so it's been a little more difficult, but it's, it's had its advantages too. We can be more creative about meeting times. Um, and they, they've done pretty well. Um, now, we've also had some other people here uh, compete in it from time to time. It wasn't just me. And uh, Sally has really been the one in central office who's been supporting it all this time. And uh, thank you to Sally. I guess that's it. Yeah. So yeah, I gotta tell you, that's that, that um, amazing uh, presentation. I think it's a fantastic thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I can tell in your enthusiasm about it. I hope I'm assuming your kids are as, I hope they're as enthusiastic as you are. Cause it, that sounds like a wonderful, um, wonderful uh, program you're doing. Lots Thank you. They, they, they love it. They love it. And they've, they've gotten, they've, they pulled in a number of awards. So that's fun too. No, I think it's fantastic. I mean, this is the kind of thing that is really what we're, we're all, uh, the school system's all about. I think it's this, this kind of stuff gives kids a whole new uh, jump on things, computer science. And I'd love to know, you know, we should probably circulate the young lady who got her PhD that took that course. Cause that's a, a great testament to you and everyone in the school district. It's not an easy thing to get. Yeah. Although Joanne came in with her group first year and took first prize, so. <laughs> no competition I didn't there, John. On me like that, but I was uh, listening to it, uh, taking notes about it. Absolutely fantastic stuff, so. Thank you. Yeah, I have, now I, I've never heard of this before. This is the first I've heard, it's a club, correct? No. After, after school club, and you've never thought of making it a class? or you like well, it? Um, the, the overarching company is Ed Advance and Skills 21 is one of the things they do. And most schools do incorporate it as part of a class, um, a business class or an engineering class or a science class. Um, but it really didn't fit into our curriculum too well for any of those. So we decided just to go with the computer science and do it as an after-school club. Okay. That works, good, it's fabulous. I agree, that's fabulous. So Joe and I had some plans of having the students come do a presentation uh, in the past and then something called the pandemic hit. And uh, uh, so hopefully we'll be able to um, get a, a group of students to come uh, present their app and share some sure. of the that they're learning through this club in, in the future. We'll make that happen. Great, thank you so much, Joe. Um, Courtney, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, um, am I coming through? You're good. Okay, so um, I run the National Social Studies Honor Society, uh, the Silas Dean chapter, um, and Ro Kappa is for the most part um, seniors who have already taken their highest level of social studies classes all the way through and they have to meet certain requirements. Once they're in the association, then um, they're engaged in community service. We have always done a, a Haiti student um, school drive um, with Doris Duggins. Um, and recently her um, organization, the um, Black Students Union, um, it helps out with that. Um, that was actually very successful this year. We collected all of the stuff. Uh, typically we do it only within the social studies realm just to keep 
the number of boxes um, limited. Um, we also um, this year got a bulletin board um, put up and the Honor Society is doing one and the BSU and the GSA, Gay Student Alliance is working um, all like all collectively working on that. Um, we haven't had much on our mural yet. Um, uh, Andrea Haas and her association have painted the mural and we were going to add caricatures of the um, social studies department, but um, we haven't been able to get that far yet. Um, it typically, this is a student run organization. I facilitate meetings only. Um, they are, um, it's very difficult when we're only online. Students who are already committed to, um, you know, going really, really heavy on the academics are really not very much interested in extending their day in a, a non-academic way. Um, so we have a core group of kids who are very committed to the, um, the community service piece. Um, the, and so in addition to being primarily online, um, we don't have regular meetings. The students call the meetings. Um, some kids are having issues with family um, and financial issues. Um, we, we're redu redu the reduction of contact time is very difficult for us. So that core group of uh, student leaders is really critically important for us. Um, in spite of all of that, we have achieved all of our goals this year. And um, we're looking forward to um, continued support from the board to go, go crazy on the academic community service. But that's it, I'm all set. Thank you, Courtney. No sure. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for that update. Uh, ben, Scar, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk a little bit about your club. Good evening, everybody. Uh, ben Sakura. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about the uh, JETS engineering design team. Um, the JETS team has been around for many, many years. Uh, we've won many, many awards. Um, this year, uh, we are continuing to work with the Source America Foundation. Uh, we traditionally help uh, individuals with disabilities uh, create a assistive technology device for them to help them do a task. Um, however, this year, because we're not uh, going out to visit our usual uh, companies that we do visit, uh, the Source America Design Challenge has, has recognized that schools are not going to be able to do that. Uh, so what they've done instead is created four scenarios uh, for us to solve. Now, as the school year started, I was kind of wondering how we were going to be able to complete this task. And I was very pleased to have uh, a senior uh, email me directly and said that he wanted to take a, a, a large leadership role in, in getting this um, uh, uh, organization going and getting this competition done. And so I was very pleased to have that student leadership. So uh, him and I talked and we've been using um, the Wednesdays as a time to meet, uh, to, to meet with our um, other students that are, you know, learning remotely and kind of come up with some different strategies um, in, in meeting the, the challenge that we're trying to solve. So this year's challenge is um, a time clock. And so it's interesting um, to hear what a what a uh, 17 and, and, and 18 year old's idea of a time clock is compared to you know a 39 year old's idea of a time clock. I remember punch cards and you know so we had a little we had a little kind of you know re reminding them you know what is a time card you know and they were like you know I heard this thing about punching you know something so that was that was a fun little lesson for them um, to to know how time cards used to work. Um, so fast forward to 2021. With many of these students working in retail and uh, the food industry, you know they're used to using uh, what we use uh, at Weatherfield High School and all the schools to to tag in, you know, to get in and out of our building those those little RFID um, tags. So they are working um, to develop uh, some type of scanner like that to uh, punch in and out. Uh, many of these students are are taking uh, Mr. Kess's uh, programming class, so they're being they're able to use um, those skills from that class for this uh, challenge. Uh, we continue to network with our, uh, my, my co-coach, uh, John Weismuller. Um, ah. he's, able to, he's, he's able to join us uh, while he's at work. So it's the, the um, his, his ability to log into Google Meet and to share some of his um, insights has been very helpful. Um, I appreciate uh, the district support in this endeavor. And um, I, I know the students appreciate it as well. So thank you for letting me share. 
Glad, glad to hear John still doing that. That's wonderful. As I'm listening to all of you talk, um, you know, there's more similarities uh, in the past than dissimilarities, but you found those creative ways to work through, you know, this isolating time and uh, to bring people together to work on those similar tasks. So thank you. So we have one more uh, extracurricular activity um, to provide an update. I think one of our festival teachers will provide a little bit of an update of how they've reimagined um, elementary festival, which is usually for our uh, fifth and sixth grade um, students across all just across all five schools come together to do a large group ensemble performance and as you can imagine that's not possible um, so I'm going to turn it over to one of them to do a little quick update on how they've reimagined elementary festival thanks Sally so Mike Steve and I are the directors we're not necessarily doing festival by ensemble this year we are going to offer it to all students all together as a festival experience so we really had to think about um, ways to engage our students that is different from our normal classes and that would really give them that experience of being a musician right these festival students are the ones who are practicing all the time they want that extra music activity and we really wanted to honor that and get them excited about that so um, our current plan is that we will be running the virtual festival program from february 2nd to march 31st we're going to be focusing on giving students an in-depth look at what the many paths music can take you it's not just playing your instrument it's not only just performing for a concert, there's many paths. Um, students will be taking musical field trips to interview and listen to performances from professional chamber groups, soloists, and even Broadway musicians that we've been able to book to talk to the students live on Google Meet, which will be really exciting. They're also going to be playing some of the musical games um, focused on increasing their literacy skills. And they're also gonna be virtually visiting a luthier shop in New York um, to talk about how instruments are made and repaired. And they're going to be creating their very own ukulele, uh, ukuleles um, at home. We're gonna provide them the kits and then we're gonna teach them how to put the kits together on Google Meet. Um, so we're really, really excited about this. We offered it to fourth to sixth grade. And you know, when we were discussing it with Sally, we said, you know, this is an after school program. It's gonna be at 4.30 for elementary schoolers. You know, they're going to opt into it. And within three days, we had over a hundred students sign up. Wow. So we actually had to switch to a waiting list because they're currently sold out of ukulele. So there's been some drama with getting materials and we're working on making sure that we can guarantee this applies to every student that has registered. But we are officially at a waiting list capacity for the festival program, which um, just gives me so much joy. I can't even really explain it. Um, we think that it's going to really give them an excitement for music and just a, a view of what their futures could be in the very different paths and you know as we said one of the challenges is repairing their instruments tuning their instruments you know being afraid to touch those things that we're suddenly telling them they can touch we think the build your own ukulele project will really empower them to learn you know what we are doing on our instruments and what they are capable of you know tuning repairing stringing and all of that fun stuff so we're really excited and it hasn't started yet but we will update you when we can <clears throat> wow. Great. Thank you. Board members, any questions for any of our uh, presenters on different after school uh, clubs? I just want to go on some of those virtual tours with you guys. They're wonderful. You're absolutely invited. I think we have a 250 Google Meet capacity. So, you know, we could get you in. We are only at 100. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, and thank you for all the work you've done to reimagine um, and also to, you know, help um, elicit your student leaders and uh, move them forward to help guide your club. So thank you guys for that. Thank you very much for keeping our kids engaged. Well done, everybody. Thank you. So we're going to move on to agenda topic number four, the SELA by literacy. Uh, this evening, we have uh, Matt Mangino, the liaison for the World Language Department, Patty Burlow from um, the um, English Language Learner Department, who's a secondary L coordinator, um, and Tara Yusko, assistant principal from the high school that's helping um, support the kind of logistical piece at Weathersfield High School. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Matt and Patty. I think they're going to present uh, the, uh, slide, the slideshow that was also linked into your agenda and provide you a little bit of an overview of the seal of biliteracy. Great. Thank you, Sally. And thank you, everyone, for having us. I'm Patty Burlow. I'm the ESL teacher and coordinator for grades 7 through 12. And I'm going to be presenting with Matt today. Um, and we have some exciting 
exciting information about the seal of bioliteracy for Wethersfield Public Schools. Uh, the seal of bioliteracy is an exciting award that students can be given when they show proficiency in English and another language other than English. So students who are bilingual will have kind of a special, um, just a special representation of that as they move forward into post-secondary. And this is not just a Connecticut thing. This is a, a national thing that's going on. If you can see in the next slide, our map. In summer of 2019, you can see there were only a handful of states who didn't have the seal of bioliteracy. Um, and then winter 2021, you'll see many more states or at the early stages or under consideration and no states have um, not had it yet. So Connecticut is one of those states that really went, went to this early and we are ex really excited about it. So how can students get this? Well, they have to demonstrate language proficiency in English and another language other than English. They demonstrate proficiency in English just by meeting the Board of Ed's graduation requirements. And then additionally, they demonstrate their proficiency in another language by taking any number of language proficiency assessments that the district can choose from. So good evening, my name is Matt Mangino. And um, so our question was, well, the question on this slide is essentially is can our world language students achieve this proficiency? So according to research that students can advance on the proficiency scale after 120 hours of world language instruction. So the high school schedule allows for about 146 hours per year. So we expect that, that a large number of our students after year one are going to achieve a proficiency level of novice high. So we expect that after the second year, our students can advance to intermediate low. And after, after the third year, our students can, we expect that our strongest students will start to, to fall inconsistently in the intermediate mid score indicator. And by the end of the next year, by the end of the fourth year, our language teachers expect that the majority of our students will consistently earn the intermediate mid scoring indicator. So that same process happens uh, the next year as they advance into the intermediate high uh, score indicator. And the reason for the slower advance through the intermediate stages is visualized through the co cone graphic on the right. So the novice students can manage very few familiar topics and they use words and memorized phrases. The intermediate students can handle a far wider range of content. And essentially there are more topics that they can understand and discuss. So the intermediate student uses more sentence level discourse and is more creative with the language. And the advanced students of which we have a few, they use a wider range of topics and paragraph level discourse. So on the AP scoring scale, a three is an intermediate mid, a four is an intermediate high, and a five is an advanced low. So this correlates directly with the AP uh, scoring scale. Uh, and so what do highly effective world language programs do? Um, so there are four elements and those, so we will set proficiency targets based on the previous slide. And then we'll design instructional pathways such as lessons, activities, and feedback to students based on those targets. So we'll be encouraging our novice students to approach sentence level discourse. Um, we're looking to teach kids to use sentences and paragraphs instead of just words. So we're going to assess internally and externally to see if those targets are being met. So an internal assessment will be something in the classroom and designed by the department or designed by teachers. And an external assessment is designed by a third party who doesn't know the students and is testing people, not just students across the country. So those are tests like the Apple, which, which we're suggesting, um, the, the AP test, the international baccalaureate test, et cetera, those kinds of tests. And then we will also use assessment data to improve our learning, um, to improve student learning. And so for example, we may find that our writing is really great, but we need to work on listening skills. Or maybe we'll find that our students need more exposure to fiction rather than nonfiction reading. So, the, so a, an external assessment like this will tell us a lot of information about our program in addition to being able to award the students. So the schools have the option to select the assessment that is most appropriate for them. My preferred vendor, or I think the, the, the best vendor for our situation is the actual assessment of performance toward proficiency in languages. 
alphabet soup. Um, so the apple test, th this is because the test is offered in French, Italian, and Spanish, in addition to a number of other languages. Um, so, so we often have, let's see, so you can see the list of languages that I included that on the slide. And some of the other options for our students include a score of, of three or better on the AP language test. Another option that's available to our students is the actual proficiency interview and writing proficiency test. And so certain uh, English learner students whose home language isn't tested via the Apple, sorry about that, um, would be, these are the candidates for the, the oral proficiency interview, okay? Um, let's see. So who would be tested? The plan for testing is to test our honors level um, juniors and seniors for world language students. And for our English learners, those students could be tested as early as 10th grade or later. So our year one students, or in our first year of testing, students would, um, students in grades 10 through 12 with proficiency in their native, uh, in their native language would be tested. And in the subsequent years, we expect to test mostly grade 11 with proficiency in their native language. Um, and then we mentioned students who are new to the school. So those students would also have the opportunity to, to achieve biliteracy in their home language. Uh, some of the languages, we mentioned some of the languages that are, that are uh, represented include Albanian, Bosnian, Chinese, German, Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish. So most of those languages are available on the, on the Apple test. And some of those students would need an alternate testing so that, that oral proficiency and interview and writing proficiency test would be appropriate for those students. Um, so we want students to earn biliteracy in their junior year so that they can include it on their college application. So we wanna test them as late as possible with as much exposure to the language as possible. So students who don't earn the seal of biliteracy in their junior year would have a second chance during fall of their senior year. On the other hand, we want our English learners to test as soon as possible so that they have the most recent exposure to their home language and the best opportunity to earn biliteracy. So our students would only obviously need to earn um, would only need to test once if they achieve the seal of biliteracy. Mm -hmm. So we envision that honors level juniors would test in the spring and honors level seniors would test in the fall in order to include that result on college applications. And we'll work with our English learner staff to develop a testing window that's most appropriate to meet those students' needs, to meet all students' needs. So in an ideal world, I think the best performing language programs from around the country use external assessments to demonstrate their students' pr progress throughout their language program. And then they can intervene uh, when a student isn't performing as expected. Uh, it would be great to test each student with an, with an external assessment to document their progress and to also support their high language achievement. So and we could use this data to power our curriculum updates and to give us a more consistent approach to student placement. So what comes of it? What do they get after they prove that they have this proficiency? Well, their transcripts will reflect it. There's also a biliteracy pin that we plan on ordering that students can wear at graduation. And college credit may be awarded by certain universities. And I think since this is more of a national movement, I'm sure that more and more colleges and universities will be looking to accept this type of credit. So. We are really excited uh, as the L coordinator. I'm very excited for our kids to have an opportunity to show off their skills that, you know, they come to this country sometimes with proficiency in another language and that goes unnoticed. And now they have something to show that they are biliterate, they are bilingual. Um, and that is something to be very proud of. So Matt and I are stoked about this and if, you know, you want any more information on this, our next slide includes tons of resources. You can uh, look there, you can reach out to us. If you have any questions, then we'd be happy to share. Any questions for us? Yeah, Patty, would you have any um, elementary students who would be proficient in two languages? Yeah, I think that's a, a tough question because we do have elementary students who come Maybe let's say if they move right from Colombia and they're proficient in Spanish, but remember they're only in grade three. So they only have probably a grade three Spanish proficiency. Okay. You know, they haven't had that the rest of the schooling in 
that that native language. So if that student though in grade three comes and they continue to have their heritage language and they continue to develop both English and Spanish as we, we want our English learners to do, then they could definitely either take it when they get to high school or maybe they wanna take Spanish when they come as a freshman to the high school or in the middle school. Um, so it's not something we would probably give to elementary students, but it's something we could sell to them as, hey, this is something you could do when you get to high school. We know you know Spanish, now you're learning English. Keep up both as you go and it's a good opportunity. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Patty, uh, Matt, or Tara? So we will be implementing the seal of biliteracy for the uh, graduating class of 2021. Um, so Tara is currently working through, you know, how do we put this on the transcript um, in power school and kind of logistical pieces behind um, um, implementing it for the first graduating class. So I think it's a wonderful opportunity and it further supports the idea of biliteracy as an important 21st century skill. And whether it's your heritage or native language or a new language you've acquired through schooling, um, that biliteracy is really uh, an advantageous skill um, given we have a global society. And um, so we're, we're excited to have this, uh, put this into motion for this, this current school year. So thank you uh, to all of you for presenting. We appreciate you coming. Thank you all for right, Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thanks, guys. So we're moving on to agenda item um, uh, number five, uh, the new course, African-American, Black, and Puerto Rican Latino course. Um, I will turn it over to John. Um, Doris Duggins, unfortunately, isn't able to join us this evening. So um, John will provide the overview for tonight. Well, hi everyone. First of all, thank you for uh, for having this meeting, having me here. I know it's a long evening. I'll try and be brief. Uh, before I start, I want to throw a quick shout out to Sarah Harris for all her help at the building. Uh, she is universally appreciated there for everything she does. Because my room is next to her office, she comes in and on a regular basis, uh, including today. So thank you, Sarah, from really from everybody, but from me as well. Um, so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about African American Latinx studies. It's a long name, as the state uh, put forward. Um, Sometime around 15 years ago, I want to say, uh, we started our own African American Studies course here. I came to this committee and we, uh, we asked to have that course here. So I'm glad that the state has finally caught up with us uh, and is uh, implementing that uh, across the, uh, the entire state. We are going to be required to offer the, uh, not for this coming school year, but for the school year afterwards. Uh, Sally thought it was a good idea and I agree that we wanna put this out as uh, an offer to pilot it for the state and do it now. Uh, so it would be one of the first schools to do it in the state. And it's easy for us because we have an experienced African-American studies teacher. Uh, we'll have to add in the other half of the year on Latinx studies. Um, the course is focused on kind of a, a from before the beginning, not just uh, African American experience here, but from whence they came and where they came and, and uh, that sort of thing. So the state has written a very uh, detailed uh, curriculum on what is to be taught and when it's to be taught, uh, but they did not include how it is to be taught. So that is going to be the challenge for the teacher. Uh, Doris Duggins is very excited to, to teach it. Um, I have a couple concerns about it that I can share with you, but I didn't know if there are any questions first. Okay, so the, the reason that uh, I'm concerned about it has to do with scheduling. Uh, I know I've brought this up with Sally before and Tara that the uh, this course will fail uh, if you do not have students in the course. And at the bottom of the, of the day, the African-American studies course that we've had has been working for well over 10 years is partly because we've been able to schedule it at exactly the right time and place. And it's not just beginning of the day, the end of the day, it's matched up against different courses. Uh, I, I, I don't want to go through all this trouble, offer the course and then not have students take it. So as you know, department liaisons had their power school access revoked and we no longer have any say in that. Uh, and I think that's a, a danger to this course if it's just kind of computer generated. So I think that's one thing to consider. Uh, the other thing to consider is materials. Uh, I'm not sure what the requirement's gonna be from the state on what type of materials that we use, uh, but certainly that's kind of an unfunded mandate, if you will, from the state on that. And so I think we need to keep our eye on that as well. 
Yeah, John, I think you bring up the complexity of scheduling, um, as particular in this course, it is a one credit course. We um, legislatively are required to keep it as a one credit course. We can't break it into two half semester courses. Um, so scheduling at the high school in every building has very complex. Um, the beautiful part of power school is it generates, um, you know, those, to, they do the math behind the scenes more than we can do in uh, kind of the manual way we used to do uh, schedules to try and create the most efficient schedule for um, students across the buildings. But I agree, you know, I think there's complexity around scheduling. Um, it's exciting to offer this course in the first year as a pilot being involved in, um, you know, they'll be offering professional development, implementing the curriculum, providing feedback. Um, we will budget a small amount of money, but they've been, um, in the webinar I was on, they talked about not huge amounts of textbooks or materials, but we will have to provide some student materials and supports for our teachers um, or teacher teaching this course next year. Um, and our hope is that the course will grow um, as we offer it from each year. Um, one of the requirements is that the course is offered. Um, you know, the requirement is not the course has to run. Well, we are very optimistic um, and pretty sure the course will run and we'll have a large number of students signing up for it each year. Um, there is a legislative requirement around this course uh, for not next year, but the following year that all school districts have to offer the course. Uh, so it's nice to be ahead of the curve and um, to be part of that process of implementing it. Um, Ingrid Kennedy, who also helps facilitate our social justice coalition is the executive director of CERC. Um, CERC is the organization that has been doing a huge amount of work um, uh, behind writing this curriculum. They've involved focus groups, experts. It is probably one of the largest curriculum undertaking that I've seen in a long time um, and actually recognized nationally for having this requirement in all schools um, around um, Black, African-American, Puerto Rican, and Latino course offerings. So I think it's a curriculum that's packed with a lot of relevant and interesting information for all our students. Um, and we're excited to see it come to fruition. Right, yeah. Sally, and you're right about the complexity of the schedule there. And, and to be honest with you, the computer cannot pick up the nuances of what is included in that master schedule. Being a necessarily good for that course. Uh, having an institutional history of someone who's done the scheduling and having people who have done the schedule for, you know, since the 90s, uh, I think I have something to add. And so I'm, I'm just concerned that if we continue with this um, you know, lack of input from the boots on the ground people who are teaching the course that we might set the course up for failure. And, and I certainly don't want to go from offering a half year course that's been very successful for well over 10 years to not being able to run it because we don't have the numbers for a full year. Bobby? Yeah, I, I don't understand. It says approval. <clears throat> so we're going to br bring this in front of the whole board for approval. Approval to have the course, but we don't have the curriculum yet. We don't, we don't have what the children uh, are reading or... Uh, the curriculum is um, uh, avail available on the CERC website. Um, and so there is a curriculum provided by CERC. Uh, they'll have some professional development and training um, related to that coming up this summer. That's kind of to be determined. Um, so yes, it will be uh, up to this committee to recommend this course proposal go to the full board uh, for approval. It'll be added to our course catalog as, another, as a new offering for our students next year. Okay. But we don't have to create the curriculum. We don't have to buy the textbook. We don't have to... Okay. We will have to buy some possible student materials. Uh, there is no textbook, but some student materials um, that will be a, but I do not expect it to be a large um, budget purchase, but we will be uh, budgeting some funds to support the course. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I guess that's the question for the committee. Uh, is there consensus in recommending this course going to the full board for approval? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is everyone on the, the board members in concurrence on this? We're all good. Okay. Yes. Very well. Let's move on. Right. Thank you so much, John. You're welcome. John. Yeah, thank you for doing all that. Thank I appreciate you. it. We appreciate it. Stephanie, uh, you're the most patient person. Uh, we're staying the very end of the agenda. So thank it's you like, for that. It's like the uh, 10 little Indians here, right? We keep losing <laughs> someone who's just like a game of clue here, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
So Stephanie uh, and Tara Ulther are here to talk a little bit about um, a um, kind of change in the course offerings for um, both our juniors and seniors in English electives. Um, several years ago, Stephanie and her department brought forward um, new courses for English electives. So I'll turn it over to her to talk a little bit about um, some of the changes we'll see next year. Yeah, all right. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. And um, this idea actually came about when I was having a meeting with Tara. We were kind of like brainstorming some scheduling scenarios. And I suggested, you know, what if we had juniors and seniors choose from the same electives during their junior or senior year? Uh, right now, um, I know many of you know already, juniors and seniors have English electives from which they choose. Certain classes are specifically for juniors. Others are for seniors. So for our junior English electives, we have four choices, America through the eyes of women, cultural change in America, the American dream and race in America. And the seniors choose from six possible electives, which are myths and legends, journalism, speech, Weathersfield studies, film as literature and Shakespearean studies. So rather than having English electives specifically for juniors or seniors, we're looking to have juniors and seniors be able to choose from any of the English electives offered during their junior and senior years. So this allows juniors and seniors to choose from any of the 10 electives rather saying, you know, there's only four you can pick from this year and six the next year. Um, they won't be limited by the grade levels. So um, what is our reasoning behind this change? Um, all of these classes have the same common core standards. They're focused on grade 11 and 12 English language arts. So if you, if you look at the curriculum, they're almost all exactly the same. Um, and every year, many we have many juniors request to take the senior English electives and vice versa. So we have to do all this paperwork, make the, make the exceptions, and this would provide um, more choice to the students. And looking at the change in graduation requirements, students who wish to focus more on English, they'll have the opportunity to do so with that humanities requirement. Um, they'll have more opportunities to take multiple English electives, whether it be junior year or senior year. Um, so I've already met with the English department. I've brought this up to them. They all agreed to this. Um, Tara's been a big help with this. Uh, Tara, did I miss anything? I don't know. No, Steph, I, I think you got it all. I mean, really, it's just another example of everything you've heard tonight of our teachers really grabbing a hold of this difficult situation and trying to be creative and offer more opportunities for our students. And I think it's great with the timing of the graduation requirements, the, the new set that are kicking in, that if somebody really wants to focus on some English classes for their humanities section, uh, this is one way to do it. So I, I think it's a great opportunity for the students. Great, thanks. Oh, Sally, you're muted. Yeah. Again, uh, Stephanie, could you talk a little bit about the college essay process and what that would look like given the classes will be with those juniors and seniors? That's a great question. And that's something we were debating at our last department meeting um, because we do spend quite a bit of time senior year um, on the college essay in the fall semester. Um, but we were saying we can keep that. We can do it junior year and senior year because the students can write two different essays. They can reflect on it. And actually one of our department members, her, her son is um, just graduated from Glastonbury High School and they have a similar setup where the students can take junior or senior electives. And she said that they write the college essay junior year and then revisit it again senior year. So we could do something similar with that where the kids could write a totally different essay or just reflect upon it and and modify it slightly. So I think we would we would have kids do it twice. I don't think there's anything wrong with writing and revisiting and um, you know maybe coming up with something new or making an idea evolve. Yeah, I think it has come up before, hasn't it? Is to have them do it in their junior year and um, work on it some more. Yeah, I love the idea. Yeah. yeah, and I have a senior home too. So having more than one college essay is definitely an advantage. So I think that's a great opportunity for our students. And again, there's some choice in there to meet their individual needs. So mm -hmm. great. Well, it sounds like you and your department have uh, thought this through well. And I think it provides a lot of opportunities for our students um, and a great sense of community also for the Wethersfield High School. Any questions from the board meeting, board members? Does that have to be approved, that um, essay, junior year and senior year, or is that just gonna happen? Um, no, just as informational, just because it's just changing a few grade levels for a course, so we brought it forward just as an informational piece. Okay. Um, Jim, question? It's a great idea combining these um, 
electives for both years and I've heard a lot of innovative things tonight. So it's, it's really very encouraging. Thank you. I like yeah. the fact that it offers choice for kids. That's the key piece for me, yeah. it's about the kids. Well, great, Stephanie, thank you so much. And um, thank you for your leadership and um, bringing this forward. Um, I guess we're on to number seven, other business. Any other business for the committee? I had a question, uh, and I apologize for sounding incredibly ignorant about it. On, for all these musical, uh, the musical classes we're doing, as we're, I'm assuming as we try to get into the better weather, we're going to effort to get outside more with the, with the instruments. And have we thought about setting anything up on the outside? You know, maybe even a tent uh, set up uh, to do uh, practices or uh, other things if we come back into school and, and even though we still have to keep to these protocols or is that getting a little ahead of ourselves? No, I think it looks a little bit different, Chris, in every school, um, you know, Highcrest had a tent. Um, some music teachers were outside. It depends on the size. You know, we also have physical education teachers outside, sure. students outside eating for lunch. So we also have to balance that idea of being outside, but also uh, safety within our buildings and how many students are out and knowing where our students are. Um, so I do think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, in some cases, as Steve shared tonight, you know, having a class of students 14 feet apart, you can't even hear them sing. Right. Um, and so you also for the singers, uh, you know, our vocal muscles and, you know, not wanting to bruise them or cause injury to them. Um, our wind instruments are different. So I, I do think our music teachers are creative, um, getting out as much as possible, especially for our um, band in, uh, players. Um, and so I think we will, you know, take a look at the guidelines as we go forward. They are constantly, um, they're a department that's very well connected to state guidance and even national guidance. And when we've met ongoing, they've brought both national and state studies. They're very well connected and keeping, um, you know, we, we bought, um, you know, masks for our instrument as they talked about, right? We bought um, instrument PPE, which I never thought a year ago we'd be buying uh, masks for a horn. And, you know, it's, it's the things we've, we've done. Um, so are so interesting. So I do think that those are opportunities that are, are talked about and looked at in each individual school, most definitely. I, I'm, I'm sure they are. And I, I wasn't, didn't want to imply they weren't. I'm just, um, it just, it, these, the effort these kids and teachers are putting into this, if there was anything we could do as a board outside of that to facilitate more of it as we get out in terms of resources, I just, you know, whether they're privately donated or whatever, you know, if they had to do, want to do a concert or, something along those lines. I was just talking out loud about it, that's all. Yeah, we'll definitely keep that in mind. I think, you know, we are seeing, you know, we saw the silver lining today about um, learning happening that we uh, probably wouldn't have happened uh, in a traditional year. Mm -hmm. um, but we also heard about some students that are hard to engage and students that have lost learning. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a really interesting time. Um, you know, I think learning has the, the loss of learning has across every grade and every content area. Um, but I think our music department and our art department has some particular challenges because they're hands-on um, you know, mediums uh, that are really hard to replicate um, in this environment. But again, the silver lining is they're teaching in a lot of different ways and a lot of different standards um, um, for our students that may not have had that opportunity. So, but we will um, definitely consider that um, and ways to support them moving forward. Any other business? Sally, just a, an update with the NEASC study. I know the NEASC uh, group came out and did the uh, recent visit. Has that been approved yet? It's something I'd like to bring before the board for review. What's the status on that? Yeah, so um, the high schools received a draft NEASC report, but um, not one to be shared publicly. So um, I would have to check to Chan Moore to find out exactly, or Tara, I'm not sure if you know when the final report will be forthcoming. I'm um, actually not sure about when it, the final one is coming. The, the draft was pretty well detailed though for us to work off with. Yeah, so once we get the final copy that can be shared publicly, that will be um, on our website and we will have a group from the high school um, come do a presentation, um, probably to the, uh, do you wanna do it student programs and services or to the full board? 
I think at this point in time, I don't think there's going to be anything that's going to come out of it from a curricular standpoint that would need to be approved. I think, think for an informational piece, coupled with the fact that we're going to be looking for a new principal at Weathersfield High School, that's going to help drive the vision. So I'd like to go before the full board if we could. Yeah, most definitely. Thank you, Sally. Yeah. Yeah, any other business? So it's 8.15. Do we have an agreement on adjourning the meeting? I will make that motion. I'll second it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Good job, everybody. Have a great night, everybody. Love these well, thank you. Thanks. Good night.